Today I'm going to let my computer read to you a harmonized version of the resurrection story. Lisa Archer, the women's first visit to the tomb on Saturday evening. Three of the women decided to go back to the tomb belonging to Joseph of Arimathea, where they had seen Christ's body laid away on Friday at sundown. They wanted to rewrap his corpse with additional spices beyond those which Nicodemus and Joseph had already used on Friday. There were three women involved, Mark 16, colon, 1, Mary Magdalene, Mary the wife or mother of James, and Salome Luke does not give their names. Matthew refers only to the two Marys, and they had bought the additional spices with their own names, Mark 16, colon, 1. They apparently started their journey from the house in Jerusalem while it was still dark Scotia had Yahuza, even though it was already early morning, Troy John 20, colon 1. But by the time they arrived, dawn was glimmering in the east, Katie Episcopus, that Sunday morning, the Idesme in Sabaton, Map 28, colon 1. Mark 16, colon 2. Luke 24, colon 1. John 20, colon 1. All you the data. TD missing in action ton sabaton. Mark 16, colon, to add best hat, the tip of the sun had actually appeared above the horizon. Banatilant used Tito you heal you a the wrist participle, the Benacodex uses the present participle, Benet Ellen used, implying while the sun was rising. It may have been while they were on their way to the tomb outside the city wall that the earthquake took place by means of which the angel of the Lord rolled away the great circular stone that had sealed the entrance of the tomb. So blinding was his glorious appearance that the guards specially assigned to the tomb were completely terrified and swooned away, losing all consciousness Matt. 28 minutes and 24 seconds. The earthquake could hardly have been very extensive. The women seemed to be unaware of its occurrence. Whether it happened before they left Jerusalem or while they were walking toward their destination, there is no evidence that it damaged anything in the city itself. But it was sufficient to break the seal placed over the circular stone at the time of interment and roll the stone itself away from its settled position in the downward slanting route along which it rolled. The three women were delightfully surprised to find their problem of access to the tomb solved. The stone had already been rolled away, Mark 1634. They then entered the tomb, sidestepping the unconscious soldiers. In the tomb they made out the form of the leading angel, appearing as a young man with flaming white garments, Mark 16, 5, who, however, may not have shown himself to them until they first discovered that the corpse was gone. Luke 24, colon, to 3. But then it became apparent that this angel had a companion, for there were two of them in the tomb. The leading angel spoke to them with words of encouragement. Don't be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus, who was crucified now. 28, colon, 5. Nevertheless, they were quite terrified at the splendor of these heavenly visitors and by the amazing disappearance of the body they had expected to find in the tomb. The angel went on, Why do you seek the living among them, with meta with the genitive, those who are dead? He is not here, but he has risen Luke 24, colon, 5, 6, just as he said now. 28, colon, 6. Look at the place where they laid him, Mark 16, colon, 6, the place where he was lying, Matt, 28, colon, 6. Remember how he told you when he was still in Galilee, saying that the Son of Man had to be betrayed into the hands of sinful men, crucified, and rise again on the third day, Luke 24, colon, 6, 7. After the angel had said this, the women, in fact, did remember Christ predictions, especially at Caesarea's leap and they were greatly encouraged. Then the angel concluded with this command, Go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. Then he added, Behold, he goes before you into Galilee, there you will see him. Lo, I have told you, Matt. 
20 April and 7. Upon receiving these wonderful tidings, the three delighted messengers set out in haste to rejoin the group of four wing believers back in the city, possibly in the home of John Mark, and pass on to them the electrifying news. They did not pause to inform anyone else as they hurried back, Mark 16, colon 8, partly because they were fearful and shaken by their encounter at the empty tomb, but in their eagerness to deliver their tidings, they actually ran back to the house mat. 28, colon 8, and made their happy announcement to the disciples who were gathered there. Mary Magdalene took pains to seek out Peter and John first of all, and she breathlessly blurred it out to them. They have taken the Lord away from the tomb, and we don't know where they have laid him. John 20, colon 2. She apparently had not yet taken in the full import of what the angel meant when he told her that the Lord had risen again and that he was alive. In her confusion and amazement, all she could think of was that the body was not there, and she did not know what had become of it. Where could that body now be? It was for this reason that she wanted Peter and John to go back there and see what they could find out. Peter and John at the tomb of the Gnostic Gospels do not mention this episode, but it was extremely important to John, who therefore took pains to record it in detail. As the two men got closer to Joseph's tomb, they began to run in their eagerness to get there and see what had happened. John 20:34. John arrived there first, being no doubt younger and faster than Peter. Yet it turned out that he was not as perceptive as Peter, for all John did when he got to the entrance was stoop down and look into the tomb, where he saw the shroud, or winding sheet, of Jesus lying on the floor. D. Dos 5. But Peter was a bit bolder and more curious. He went inside the chamber and found it indeed empty. Then he looked intently at the winding sheet because it was lying in a very unusual position. Instead of being spread out in a long, jumbled strip, it was still all wrapped together in one spot and he did like many the ice he not hold on. Moreover, the super and long kerchief that had been moved around the head of Jesus was not unwound and tossed on the shroud but was still wrapped together and lying right above it BB.67. In other words, no one had removed the grave clothes from the corpse in the usual way. It was as if the body had simply passed right out of the headcloth and shroud and left them empty. This was such a remarkable feature that Peter called John back and pointed it out to him. All of a sudden it dawned on the younger man that no one had removed the body from that tomb. The body had simply left the tomb and left the grave clothes on its own power passing through all those layers of cloth without unwrapping them at all. Then John was utterly convinced Jesus had not been removed by other hands. He had raised himself from the dead. That could only mean he was alive again. John and Peter decided to hurry back and report to the others this astounding evidence that Jesus had indeed conquered death and was alive once more private interviews with the women and with Peter for some reason. Peter and John did not tell Mary Magdalene about what they had deduced before they left. Perhaps they did not even realize that she had followed along behind them at her slower pace. In fact, she may not have gotten back to the tomb until they had already left. She arrived all alone, but she did not immediately orient her until she had paused to weep for a little while. Then she stooped down once more to look through her tear-stained eyes into the tomb John 20, 11. To her astonishment it was ablaze with light, and there she did help two angels in splendid white robes, sitting at each end of the place where Jesus had lain the twelve. Immediately they the very same pair that had spoken to the three women at their earlier visit asked her, wonderingly, Why are you crying? Had she not understood the glorious news they had told her the first time? But all Mary could think about was the disappearance of Christ's body. 
They have taken my lord away, and I don't know where they have laid him. She lamented. To this the angels did not need to give any answer, for they could see the figure of Jesus standing behind her, and they knew his response would be better than anything they could say. Mary could sense that someone else had joined her, and so she quickly turned around and tried to make out through her tear blur eyes who the stranger might be. It wasn't one of her own group, she decided, so it had to be the gardener who cared for this burial ground of Joseph of Arimathea. Even when he spoke to her, Mary did not at first recognize Jesus' voice, as he kindly asked her, Woman, why are you crying? Whom are you looking for? Be off fifteen. All she could do was wail at him accusingly. Sir, if it is you who have taken him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will carry him off as if somehow her womanly strength would be equal to such a task. It was at this point that the kindly stranger revealed himself to Mary by reverting to his familiar voice as he addressed her by name, Miriam. Immediately she realized that the body she was looking for stood right before her, no longer a corpse but now a living, breathing human being and yet more than that, the incarnate God. Rabbi, she exclaimed that is to say, Master and cast herself at his feet. It was only for a brief moment that she touched him, for he gently withdrew himself from her, saying, Don't keep touching me. The negative imperative me repassy on you implies discontinuance of an action already begun, for I have not yet ascended to my father. Whether he did so later that afternoon and then returned afterward to speak to the two disciples on the road to Emmaus and the rest, the group back in Jerusalem that evening is not altogether cleared. But if Mary was asked not to touch him at this point in the day and the disciples were freely permitted to touch him that evening, it must be inferred that he did report briefly back to God the Father in heaven before returning to earth once more for his post-resurrection 40-day ministry. This private interview with the risen Lord did not continue much longer. So far as Mary was concerned, for he commissioned her to hurry back to the group in the city and prepare them for his coming to join them in his resurrection body. Go to my brethren, he said, and tell them I am going up to my father and your father, my God and your God, John 20:17. This definitely confirms the deduction that Christ did in fact make a brief visit to heaven during the middle of Easter Sunday before reappearing to Cleophas and his companions on the air mouth road. Nevertheless, Jesus did not make his ascent to heaven at this precise moment, for he waited around long enough to meet with the other two women who had earlier accompanied Magdalene to the tomb at daybreak. Apparently Mary, the mother or wife of James, and alone meet with her had decided to go back once more to visit the empty tomb. Presumably they noticed that Mary Magdalene had slipped away again after conferring with Peter and John, and they must have guessed where she had gone. Very soon after Magdalene had left Jesus and headed back toward the city, but not so soon that they actually met one another on the way, the two women drew near to the same spot where they had encountered the two angels on their first visit, Luke 24, 4. Please watch part 2. Now to start part 2. We continue to allow my computer to read the rest of the harmonized version of the resurrection stories. We are not told whether the women actually entered the tomb once again, or whether they met Jesus just outside, but at any rate he apparently accosted them after they had arrived, and he greeted them at 20 April and 9. The Greek charite here probably represents either the Hebrew Shalom or the Aramaic Southeast Lama. 
literally. To grieve means rejoice. Whereas the Hebrew means peace. Their reaction at seeing their risen Lord was similar to Magdalene's. They cast themselves at his feet and kissed them as they clung to him. Jesus reassured them as they were adjusting to the shock of seeing him alive again. Don't be afraid. Then he continued with a mandate similar to the one he had given to Magdalene. Go and pass on the word happened by late to my brethren that they are to depart for Galilee, and there they will see me. It is highly significant that our Lord first revealed himself in his resurrection body, not to the men, the eleven disciples themselves, but rather to three of the women among the group of believers. Apparently he found that they were even readier in their spiritual perception than the eleven men of his inner circle, on whom he had spent so much of his time during the three years of his teaching ministry. Be that as it may, it seems quite clear that Jesus chose to honor the women with his very first post-resurrection appearances before he revealed himself to any of the men, even to Peter himself. Yet we must gather that Peter was the first of the male disciples to see his Lord alive after the resurrection, for at some time after Mary Magdalene came back from her second visit to the tomb and her confrontation with Jesus there, Simon Peter must have had a personal reunion with Jesus. This we learn from Luke 24 minutes and 34 seconds, where we are told that the disciples in the house of John Mark in Jerusalem had learned from Peter that he had already seen Jesus and had talked with him, even before the two travelers returned from their journey toward Emmaus and reported back that they had broken bread with Jesus at the inn. They found as they came back with their excited news and expected everyone there to be surprised at their account of talking with the risen Lord that the rest of the group were already aware of the stupendous event. The two travelers were delighted to meet with ready acceptance by all who heard them, for they were assured by all their friends, yes, yes, we know that Jesus is alive and has returned to us for he has appeared to Simon Peter as well Luke 24 minutes and 34 seconds. Presumably they were already aware of the end. The doc 22 of the earlier interview reported to them by Mary Magdalene who told them, I have seen the Lord, and then relate his announcement about descending to the Father in heaven. See and John 20, 18 and by the other Mary and her companion. Alone we who had passed on his instructions about the important rendezvous to be held up in Galilee. As for this personal interview between Christ and Peter, we have no further information, so we cannot be certain as to whether it was before or after his ascension to the Father and his subsequent return in the afternoon of Easter Sunday. All we can be sure of, and even this is perhaps arguable, is that he talked with Peter before he met with Cleopas and the other disciple on the road to Emmaus. It is interesting to know that Paul confirms that Christ did in fact appear to Peter before he revealed himself to the rest of the 11 one killer. 15 colon 5. The interview with the disciples on the way to Emmaus. The next major development on that first Easter Sunday involved disciples who were not of the eleven, the number to which they were reduced after the defection of Judas Iscariot. Cleopas was relatively undistinguished among the outer circle of Jesus following. At least he is hardly mentioned elsewhere in the New Testament record. As for his companion, we are never even told what his name was even though he shared in the distinction of being the first to walk with Christ after his resurrection. Jesus apparently chose these two disciples outside the circle of the eleven in order to make it clear to all of his church that he was equally available or accessible to all believers who would put their trust in him as Lord and Savior, whether or not they belonged to any special circle or had come to know him at an earlier or a later date. 
Perhaps he also felt it for their future testimony to the world that they had become convinced of his bodily resurrection, even in the face of their initial assumption that he was already dead and gone. Such a manifestation would be of special helpfulness to future generations. One thing is certain. A true believer does not have to belong to the original band of chosen apostles in order to experience a complete transformation of life and the embracing of a new understanding that life with Jesus endures forever, in spite of all the adversities of this life, and the malignity of Satan and the terrors of the grave. The Emmaus travelers replied, Did not our hearts glow within us on the way and as he opened the scriptures to us? Luke 24 minutes and 30 seconds. They thus became the first example of what it means to walk with Jesus in living fellowship and hear him speak from every part of the Hebrew scriptures. This account is contained only in the Gospel of Luke. That evangelist who took such special interest in the warm and tender personal relationships that Jesus cultivated with individual believers, both male and female, we may be very grateful to him and the Holy Spirit who guided him that this heart-stirring record was included in the testimonies of Jesus' resurrection, for this encounter more fully than the others shows how life may be transformed from discouragement and disappointed hope into a rich, satisfying and fruitful walk of faith with a wonderful Savior who has conquered sin and death for all who put their trust in him. One interesting feature about this interview deserves comment. As in the case of Mary Magdalene, Jesus did not appear to the Emmaus travelers at the first with his customary form, features, or voice, and they failed to recognize his identity. They took him for a stranger who was new to Jerusalem, Luke 24 minutes and 18 seconds. It was not until after he had taught them how the Old Testament had clearly foretold how Messiah would first have to suffer before entering into his glory and indeed not until after they had sat down for a bite to eat at some roadside cafe and heard him give thanks to God for the food that they realized who he was. And then, at the moment of recognition, he suddenly left them, vanishing from their sight. This sudden disappearance showed them that this new friend of theirs, who had flesh and bones and could use his hands to break bread with them, was a supernatural being. He was the God-man who had triumphed over death and had risen from the grave to resume his bodily form. The marvelous new body was power to appear and disappear according to his will and purpose, as he saw fit. As soon as Jesus had left them, the two wayfarers sped back to Jerusalem as fast as their legs could carry them. They lost no time in making their way to the assembled believers and sharing with them the electrifying news of their lengthy encounter with the risen Lord. And they began to relate their experiences on the road and how he was recognized by them in the breaking of the bread. The interviews with the assembled disciples Luke tells us that while the Emmaus travelers were finishing their report to the assembled believers, the Lord himself entered through the locked doors and appeared in their midst Luke 24 minutes and 36 seconds, much to the amazement of all those who had not previously seen him, risen from the dead. Graciously he greeted them with his customary peace be with you. The Greek Irene Thailand doubtless represents the Aramaic Bessie Lama Gamma John 2019. Then he hastened to allay their fears by showing them physical evidence of his bodily resurrection and restoration to life. Why are you troubled and why do doubts arise in your heart? He asked Luke 24 minutes and 38 seconds and he held out his pierced hands for them to see and removed his sandals to show a nail hole through his feet. BB.3940. He even uncovered the scar of the gash that the Roman spear had made in his side as he hung lifeless on the cross. John 20, 20. Look at my hands and feet, he said to them. For it is really I feel me and see, for a mere spirit does not have flesh and bones such as you behold me to have Luke 24 minutes and 39 seconds. 
How many took advantage of Christ's offer to touch him? We cannot be sure, but numbers of those in the room found even this evidence too amazing to be believed, so he offered a yet more dramatic proof. Do you have anything to eat? He asked them. They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he proceeded to eat it as they looked on with one third and the light Luke 24 colon 4243. Having thus demonstrated that he was none other than their beloved master risen from the dead, Jesus proceeded to explain to them, as he had explained to the two on the road to Emmaus, that all the amazing occurrences of passion we of course fully predicted in the Hebrew scriptures all the way from Genesis to Malachi. The portions referred to were threefold, Moses, i.e., the Pentateuch, the prophets, and the Psalms. Notice that by this period, all the Old Testament books other than the Pentateuch and the Psalms were included under the classification of prophets, including all the books of history, Daniel, and probably the wisdom books of Proverbs and Ecclesiastes as well, unless Psalms is intended to represent all five books of poetry. The entire Hebrew Bible is about the Son of God but his particular focus was on those predictions of his ministry, sufferings, and death found in the Pentateuch in Genesis 3, 15, 49 minutes and 10 seconds, the Buterium.18, 15 to 18, and all the types of priesthood and sacrifice contained in the Dura of the Prophets, e.g., Isaiah 7, 14, 9, 6, 52 colon 13 53 colon 12 and the psalm psp yes 1610 and ps 22 which foretold all the events that found their culmination on this easter day luke 24 colon 44 46 thus he assured them that all the apparently tragic events of the last few days were in exact fulfillment of the great plan of human redemption that God had decreed from before the beginning of all time. Instead of feeling intimidated and disappointed by the shame of the cross, they were to see in it the greatest victory of all time, and they were to trust with the broad the good news of salvation which by his atonement he had purchased for repentant sinners everywhere. This led Jesus quite naturally to the earliest pronouncement of the Great Commission. He told the disciples that repentance was to be preached in his name to all nations for the forgiveness of sins, beginning from Jerusalem, and that they as eyewitnesses were under special obligation to carry out the proclamation of this message. Encyclopedia of Bible Difficulties, Sauter Van, 1982, pages 347-352. I hope this reading has made you realize that the resurrection stories in the Bible are not nearly as hopeless as some people would want you to believe. Oh, by the way, sorry, my recorder's a little stupid, so I did link the uh, site that I got the harmonized version of the resurrection stories in the video's description in case you didn't understand my stupid computer readings very well. You can read it on the site for yourself.